So Mr. MSP, what risk and vulnerabilities do you bring? Should we hire you? And if they say none, okay, swipe left or right or whichever <laughs> way it is to get rid of them. <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 452 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and joining me is Donna Grindle from Cardinal. What's up, Donna? I would have to say nothing. I'm going to go with nothing (laughs) because if I try to let all the things happen, it's going to get tricky in my head. Yeah, I wish I could say the same. <laughs> it's always tricky in your head, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So today we've had to deal with a business email compromise, which seems to be the, you know, the order of the week here lately. It's like, there are Monday. People stop letting people into your email accounts. So, well, well, and my favorite when you told me about this one is that the client emailed you on Friday to let you know they had an email compromise. <laughs> but yeah. when you have an email compromise, they block those kinds of emails. So don't email mm-hmm. about your email compromise. Yeah. So that was, um, that was interesting. And, um, so yeah, got that all cleaned up at least the compromise part. Now it's a matter of figuring out what exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, uh, only saving grace is it wasn't healthcare. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yep. So talk to your people, folks, make sure they understand what not to do. <laughs> Stop clicking. Well, I mean, these are getting tough though. I mean, they're getting tough Yeah. to, to catch. And, uh, you know, people weren't good at it when they, you know, as people got better at it now, they're getting better. I mean, you can't look for the same grammatical issues or, you know, the, the simple stuff because AI is cleaning it up for them. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that, that brings me to something I'm going to do uh, probably this week. I'm going to release a video uh, on, um, on how to check your own email links and such. So mm-hmm. if you got an IT vendor, then get them to do it. My clients do that to me all the time. I'm like, here, check this email. <laughs> it's like, send me all your junk mail so I can tell you if it's okay or not. I know. I love those. They do that, which I'm fine with it because sometimes mm-hmm. it's, sometimes we stop bad things from happening. Other times, like today, I had one come in from a healthcare provider, completely okay email, but it came from Optum. <laughs> Worth checking. It came from Optum and... The like no warning that wasn't expecting it. And it was, here's an Adobe eSign document. Like is it was about as suspicious as it could possibly be, but it was mm. legit. It turned out to be legit, but terrible, terrible, terrible business practices to just send an email like that out of the blue. Nah. Mm-mm. So that said, if you don't have an MSP or IT vendor, we'll talk more about you MSP folks in a little bit. <laughs> Then I'm going to do a video on how you can kind of do your own checking and look at, look at links, figure out what's there, run things through scanners and all that kind of stuff using free online tools. Awesome. And we will share that with people. Yeah. So Maybe. there is a way you can open up links without getting infected. Yeah. <laughs> I'll show you or how. Just, just have somebody, you know, have them scan it. Go look. <laughs> Just yeah. email it to somebody you don't like. <laughs> Say, click on this. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me if this is okay. <laughs> it's like the, you know, taste this and see if it's bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know about you, but I hear that in my house a lot. I'm like, wait, smell yeah. this. See if it's, <laughs> it, it, why? Yeah. If you think it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This milk, uh, this milk smells a little bad. Taste it and see. If it's <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm good. I'm really I'm good. I'm good. It, when in doubt, throw it out. You know? Yeah. Ain't nothing worse though than pouring your big bowl of cereal, putting the milk in there, <sighs> oh. and not knowing until you take that first big bite and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> that is the good thing about growing up on the dairy farm where you just got your milk from 
the cow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you knew to always check because there was no date, you know. All right. You just, you just always give it a little sniff. Mm-hmm. How long has this been at the house? Now, good news is with a lot of kids, well, and it, you know, you used to have all those boys, so milk didn't stay long enough. No, I mean, we went through a gallon a day, but now that they're not here anymore, except for one of them, we have milk that sometimes spoils now, which we never had before. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But uh, speaking of spoiling some things, uh, we do have to say that if you were planning on coming to the Price 8 boot camp, I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's too late for you. Yeah, I mean, there's been a few times where we've been able to get people in, and I, we just can't anymore. I mean, we've had we had uh, we we put it on the website that we pretty much stopped accepting people after the last podcast, and uh, but good news is we'll do another one, just not anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, so uh, lesson learned. Get it in early. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'd say, yeah, go ahead, look, go ahead and put it on your plans for 25. Yeah. Go ahead and stick it out there. You, you know how much the cost is going to be roughly. So go ahead and plan for that next year. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how it all works out. Uh, we always have an interesting eclectic group and we've got some, some that are alumni returning. So they'll be a kind of ready for that next moment of what? <laughs> yeah. This time, so. Yep. Yeah. But don't worry. Uh, we always got something new to share. Mm-hmm. Plus, the number of times people are like, did y'all cover that the last time I was here? Yeah. I yeah. can tell you right now, there's going to be a lot that we didn't cover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, there's so new much stuff. Stuff. Golly, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, so, next week, this comes out on Friday, and Tuesday we'll be busy with, you know, wearing people out. But it's usually, you know, a productive event, if not an exhausting one for all of us. Yep. All righty. So we want to remind everybody, leave us a review if you like today's podcast. And also share it out to all your friends and enemies. That should cover pretty much everybody. (laughs) You got to subscribe somewhere, you know, make sure it's downloaded. I mean, that's how you get the, uh, you know, the, the reputation that we need and we know about our reputation we need your help <laughs> yeah we do clearly. <laughs> uh, so. yeah and check us out on youtube we got uh, bunches of youtube shorts and all kind of other stuff out there so go check those out leave some comments reviews likes shares smash it, all kind of buttons hit control alt delete whatever you want to do <laughs> leave a comment maybe we'll see it <laughs> we're struggling with those things clearly <laughs> All All right, right. we got a lot to do, though. Let's hit some fun uh, stuff. So today we're going to be talking about mitigating MSP risks. So if you are an MSP or you have an MSP or you may ever hire an MSP, probably want to listen. Yeah, pay attention. Yeah, because one thing is for sure, no matter who you hire, no matter what vendor you bring in, a lot of them bring in risks. MSPs. Top of the list, we bring in all of our software, our remote access tools, all these things. Every one of those increases the risk that you didn't have before you hired us. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of crazy. You're hiring us to reduce your risk and vulnerabilities, and we're bringing more risk and vulnerabilities. (laughs) So you're reducing some that they can't handle on their own, Mm -hmm. but you're bringing in some that they're expecting you to handle when you come to the door. Exactly. So it's kind of like taking your five kids into an antique shop, (laughs) right? (laughs) Sure. We can go there. (laughs) Uh, That's it. Yeah. But you know, it's a good thing to ask though. Like let's say you're, you're trying to hire an MSP. A good question might be to say, So, Mr. MSP, what risk and vulnerabilities do you bring should we hire you? And if they say none, okay, swipe left or right or whichever (laughs) way it is to get rid of them. (laughs) 
uh, what's a good swipe? You want the bad swipe? Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't do the swiping, so I don't know which way to swipe. <laughs> I'm swipeless. Swiper. <laughs> Swiper. No it's a whole nother. There. Yeah. All right. So let's get into it. Um, let's go down the path of the hippo say what first, because we want to talk about some use of online tracking technologies. Not that we haven't talked about that before, but yes. it's a little bit of updates on that. Yeah. I mean, no one's really dealing like this is, this is restating and trying to be clear as clear as lawyers can. <laughs> on the uh, online tracking technology and HIPAA. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, they're being ridiculous. Uh, so there's that side. And then they're like, well, we're reading the law and having to apply it to what we know the technical part of it. Is. You know, and we're trying to find that middle ground. In the meantime, people like us, we're in the middle. <laughs> Going, mm -hmm. somebody get here. <laughs> but. The bulletin is to, it's a restatement where they're defining what is tracking technology and how do the HIPAA rules apply to regulated entities' use of tracking technologies. And then they go through, what if you're doing tracking on a user-authenticated page? What if you're doing tracking on an unauthenticated page? What if you're doing tracking in mobile apps? <laughs> and then, what are your compliance obligations for regulated entities when using tracking. Woo. Yeah. You know, so at least it's very targeted descriptions, we'll call it. Uh, but I did but did notice one where it was in the section where it was talking about the unauthenticated web pages. So I often get uh, caught up in these discussions about, well, if somebody's not my patient and they come to the web page, and I gather information about them. Well, they're not my patient now. Is not PHI. You know, is, is that true? Can, can <laughs> we document that and you know go with it? But here's one of the things in a discussion, not specifically that, but near that statement, adjacent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a quote from the bulletin. Further, visits to unauthenticated web pages do not result in a disclosure of PHI to tracking technology vendors if the visit is not related to an individual's past, present, or future healthcare or payment for healthcare. Ouch. Future. Future. Yeah. And but I'm I, can like, see, I can see people arguing that, though. Like, how am oh, I supposed yeah. to know? Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it, it gets back to the same old thing. It's a business decision. But more importantly, can you document it? Yeah. You know, and, document why you think it's okay. And it could be also, like, depending on what kind of site you have or the landing page or the web form and all these things. Because if, if it's like, click here to tell me about you to see if you, if you want to be a patient. Well, then there's probably some likelihood that they may be a patient in the future. So, mm -hmm. you know, well, versus it had some an example, one. like if somebody goes to the web page and they're looking up, it's a student who's looking up information about oncology services for a paper they're working on. That's one thing. But if it's a patient that's looking it up, now you got a whole different thing. And that's where this statement comes into play is, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a student looking it up, but. Do you know the difference? Number one. Number two, is it going to involve the future health, health care, or payment for health care? Yeah. So grab that crystal ball and check it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there, there is, whatever you're doing, go back, take what, if you've done what we've been telling you, which is to evaluate everything you're doing, either do none of it, or whatever you are doing, you've documented clearly what is happening, what data is involved, and why you think you're okay. If you have done what we told you to do, then you need to go back to your documentation with this new uh, guidance and compare it to make sure you're still good. 
If you haven't done it, please, now's the time. <laughs> That's all That's I true. got. That's true. Mm-hmm. All right. So, a couple other little quick ones before we get to uh, the uh, Senator Cassidy published a white paper reviewing the changes needed in the HIPAA privacy rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a pretty interesting, you know, for most part, it's, it's, it's worth a read if you are so inclined, but points out the concerns that we already know and, and ideas about what needs to be dealt with. And, and it made a really good point that, you know, there's been changes to the privacy rule, but the point it made, and I was like, oh, it was talking about right of access and the minimum necessary rule. And, you know, before, even even if you had an electronic medical record, if patients wanted their records, you still printed them out because that's the way the patients could get them. Right. You, you had paper when this was originally done. So if there was data that they didn't need to see, that, that got redacted. Mm-hmm. Okay? You can't do that. You can't do that anymore. And I'm like, oh, good point. That hasn't changed. Yeah. So you can't just redact. Anyway, it's it's got some really good information about the fees for record retrieval, what is health data, what is outside of HIPAA, what is inside of HIPAA. It's a really detailed explanation of the scenario we're in, and it's a call to action for Congress to, you know, get into the weeds where this law is concerned, along with you know other privacy rules. So. And then the other one, other little quick one. That one's a fun <laughs> one that you and I had to. We have our own little discussion about, and it, it's because we talk about this, where, you know, the cases where they're like, oh, well, the doctor wants the Alexa in the surgery room so they can just, you know, play the music that they want to hear. I get it. <laughs> you know, I use music when I'm in deep, you know, work, needing deep focus. However, this is why I say nay, nay. <laughs> uh this is a I think this is New Jersey. Yeah. Uh this lady ends up talking to reporters because she wakes up one morning and there's an, a voicemail 67 minute long voicemail. <laughs> I thought they stopped doing that. Like it just cuts you off when you're leaving a voicemail. Usually when I get to I, like a minute in it's like click. I'm like what? I wasn't done. I, well, clearly hers doesn't do that. I guess and, not. And 67 minutes while she's asleep, she gets a voicemail and it's Alexa calling her. Her own Alexa called her and left a recording. Hmm. And then she she first goes to uh, Amazon and they're like, well, not our problem. You need to check your password. <laughs> and And then they go to the reporters who then go back to... <laughs> Amazon, and then you suddenly get a very quick call from customer service who will be doing some retraining of the customer service person that told you check your passwords. <laughs> and by the way, we'll give you a $50 credit on your account because of your problems. Basically, what had happened was Alexa thought she heard her name. <laughs> yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like well, except me? when, yeah. It, and, and so basically, then Alexa started listening and then was trying to figure out what you wanted. So the apparent discussion with her telling Alexa to turn down the light, dim the lights, and her husband pointing out that someone loved the vodka sauce that she made for dinner. In amongst that, and I don't know what else, she could hear bits and pieces. Of those things, it decided that she had told it, find my phone, where it would call the phone, and that's how I got there. So <laughs> anybody who thinks, and, and they're like, we don't even know what word could have possibly triggered it. <laughs> so. so Alexa is now acting like an old grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought you called me. <laughs> but uh, the, the the better uh, news is, you know, they now understand that, Yeah, because I think the statement was, this, this is really creepy that it does it. At least now they know. Nothing's yeah. changed. It's still creepy. Yeah. 
That's it. Yeah. Move along. But I mean, everybody, I would think, should know by now, these things are always listening. I don't care what anybody says, they're always listening. Because you have any kind of conversation, especially if it's unique to some topic you've never discussed before, and watch what happens when you start getting all these ads popping up on your phone. (laughs) It just, it, yeah. What it is, is there's so many apps that ask you if it's okay to do things like that. Mm -hmm. And people just blow by it. Yeah. Until all of a sudden something happens, and then they're like, well, where did that come from? And you don't even know what app. You said, hey, that's okay. Go ahead. I'm, I'm waiting on somebody to, like, they're going to they're gonna pass away, and Facebook's going to come up and, and, like, take all the inheritance from everybody because you said, in the terms of service, you was going to give them all your money when you die. Let's don't go down that path. <laughs> we we'll go back to South Park again. And this is... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but th- those are the two quick ones. And now let's get into for the rest of this discussion the uh, new release from CISA and the NSA saying uh, we released uh, cybersecurity information sheets on cloud security best practices. And there, there are several different ones that, that, that are in the release. And you can go check them out. And and we did notice a new TLA because now there are, we can't just say bad actors anymore. We needed a third letter. <laughs> now we, <laughs> but we did discuss what we couldn't say BA. All right. So MCAs are for malicious cyber actors. There you go. Yeah. So in this discussion, we will now say MCAs. And there is a specific, you know, there's secure data in the cloud and segmentation and encryption and secure identity and all these things. Plenty of things that we could focus on, but this one seemed like a little bit more, you know, to our normal audience questions is mitigate risk from managed service providers in cloud environments. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, one we should pay attention to. Indeed. And it starts as I, and I think all of them, you know, try to get this across anytime it talks about third parties. Security in the cloud is a shared responsibility. Mm-hmm. I think it's a shared responsibility across the platform. If you, you're, yeah, period. Uh, yeah. Period. Whatever you're doing with digital today, security, you can't assume somebody else is doing it. Yeah. And we've no matter what you do. Yeah. yeah, cybersecurity is everybody's job. So, yeah. so the principle extends to the use of third-party services and capabilities as offered by MSPs. MCAs are known to have an interest in targeting MSPs and using compromised MSPs to target customers. Mm-hmm. I wonder why. Because we got the keys to the kingdom. Yeah, they do go on to say MSPs, by their nature, must have access to the data and resources, and will have privileged accounts for the most part. Mm -hmm. That's not news to us, but it apparently could be news to others. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it goes on, you know, but it points out if they're attacked, the potential for a successful pivot is not looking very good once you know just how much control MSPs have. So then, a little further down, it says, in contingency planning, organizations should identify and understand the agreements provided by MSPs. Take it from there, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. They, oftentimes we've uh, discovered that MSPs don't understand the agreements either. No. I mean, and it's not just your agreement with an MSP's agreement with their clients, but it's also the MSP's agreements with their vendors. Right. So you got to know both sides. Yep. And yeah, we know there's some deficiencies there usually. Yeah. I I mean, mean, if you're going to, let's just pick anybody, you're going to sell the Dell firewalls or whatever, and you need their cloud coverage on those things. 
I mean, you're going to sign the form, the terms, because you got to have it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you should just blindly sign them. Just like when MSP is like, hey, just sign the business association agreement and then you can do business with them. Just like, no. no. <laughs> you no. need to understand what's in it, but you also need to understand what it means for you as well as your client, mm -hmm. what areas could possibly be negotiated. I mean, you, don't, you can't just go out there and just sign a bunch of stuff. And unfortunately, that's the advice I see most often in the MSP community. Well, just sign that paper is all you got to do <laughs> and follow, <laughs> sign the paper and follow best practices and security. That's what I see all the time. It drives me nuts. Wow. So you don't even know what you're committing to. You don't even know. So if, if that's what the MSP is doing, and then you have the customers not reading it, you know, you can see how things continue to go awry. Mm -hmm. And so this is trying to say, okay, here are the recommendations from NSA and CISA when organizations choose an MSP. So my thought is that if you are an MSP, you should be aware of these, David. Don't oh, you yeah. think? Yeah. You should not only be aware of them, but mitigate. <laughs> And even provide documentation, preferably in advance of even being asked for it. Yeah, that's what that's what I say is why not go right in and and you know, one of the things that, for example, that we do is we talk about, look, we're not going to uh focus just on HIPAA. We're gonna tell you that right off the bat. Here's what we're gonna do. And we've got hiccup and we've got NIST and we've got uh, CISA and we've got 405D and we've got all of these resources that we blend together for a reason. Well, why not do the same thing uh, if you're the MSP and, and that's kind of what you're suggesting there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, then if you go in the door and say, I don't know if you've seen this guidance from the NSA and CISA, but this is what they say you should worry about. Now, all of this does not apply to all scenarios. Don't take of the seven things, one doesn't apply, so I'm not going to do any of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's go through them and get what your thoughts are that MSP should do to address it, and then we'll talk about what we think that the clients should be asking the MSPs. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Number one, hit it. So we're doing the recommendations? Well, yeah, that's what we were just talking about. <laughs> just want to make sure with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows where we're going? Did somebody call my name? Somebody call my name. <laughs> All right. Number one, um, Adhere to important security standards as part of selection criteria when choosing MSP services. So, I mean, for me, yes, absolutely. I want to understand what my vendors are doing because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, my, a lot of my services I consider mostly pass through services. Like if I'm putting cybersecurity software in your computer, Yes, I have the ability to manage it and all this kind of stuff, but it's not my actual software. I didn't develop it and I don't support it and all this other stuff. So I need to understand what my vendors are doing on the security front. Yeah. Now, I, I would say to this, like we talk about, go ahead and get Hickscrim. Mm -hmm. You know, supply chain risk management, some of those tools, some of those documents. Use Hiccup if you want to use Hiccup. Anything that's that, and that references the important security standards, and be able to walk in the door and say, hey, um, you know, if I wanted to hire an MSP, I would be thrilled if they would walk in the door handing me, here's how we address these concerns. Mm -hmm. And with the security standards, we follow, and not... Not, we're going to follow for you. Mm -hmm. We're going to tell you, you have to follow Hiccup, but we're not going to follow it. I want to know what you're following. Yeah. Not just your services. Because, you know, we 
the whole eat your own dog food kind of thing. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can. So that's, that's what I would say to that first one there. Yeah. I mean, think about it from a, from a sales perspective. If you're walking in the door and you're handing a prospect this documentation, here's, here's some things you should be aware of as you're trying to hire somebody. These are risks that MSPs, all MSPs for the most part, mm -hmm. are bringing to the table. And here's how we've already identified and mitigated said risk and vulnerabilities. Dude, everybody else that walks in the door after you, they're they're on their heels because now they've got to address this thing and they're not even they're not even prepared to do that. Yeah, so just know if you're up against David, he's prepared. Yeah, I'm gonna obliterate you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he talks big, doesn't he? <laughs> All right, so the next one you're probably going to need to explain IAM just a tish before we go down the path because IAM is 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 mentioned in you know identity access management is hit in like three of these, but uh, yeah, I mean just yeah. on very very super high level, it's just a way to authenticate who the user is. Right. Yeah, it's the identity and what access they are taking. Yep. Are you using? So, All right. So second one, choose services and service levels that provide visibility into MSP actions via IAM, or some people say I am, but <laughs> and log analytic systems. Wow. Now mm -hmm. this is a challenge because mm -hmm. number one, most people don't have either of these <laughs> in the smaller practices or smaller environments. And number two, who's looking at this stuff, mm -hmm. which good question to ask your MSP. So mm -hmm. like my suggestion would be MSP. You should figure out what your tools are doing, how you can find that log information, whatever way you want to do it and then understand how to provide that to your client. So, hey, Mr. Client, here's the log files of everything we've done. Every time we've patched something, every time that we've changed something, every time that we've accessed remotely your systems, here's all that, those, that log information. We've looked at it, everything looks great, but here it is for you to look at as well. Yeah, and, and I would say you can only do, again, this is, Again, it gets to what's applicable, what's reasonable or appropriate in your environment mm -hmm. uh, where those things are concerned. It is not appropriate to say you don't have to worry about it. Just trust me. Like that's <laughs> Yeah. That, that would not be the answer I would look for there. But what I would look for is to say, because it's talking about the services and the service levels. Mm -hmm. So, again, it gets to, well, you know, if you get our low end, we don't have to show you anything. We don't have to give you reports or anything, right? I right. mean, you think about how many things that you sign up for, and it's like, well, you can get it for free. But the free version, you don't get any of the logs. They're being created, but you don't get to see them. You know, you got to pay to see them kind of stuff. Right. So from that perspective, it's understand the services that I want to understand the services that you are providing and the level of access that that would require and how you manage the risk that you could have insider issues, privilege abuse, or uh, account takeover, you know, stolen credentials. You can't claim that's not going to happen. I mean, we've had too many cases with stolen credentials occurring through actual developers and support people. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would just want to know what level of access do you need to do your job, the services that I'm selecting, and how do you make sure that's not going to be abused by your staff, and how do you make sure that if, if they are tricked into giving up their credentials, if they give up the goods, how can we limit the damage? How are you mitigating that risk? Mm -hmm. That would be what I would want to know. So. Next one here, perform and test configurations to ensure that logs and IAM information related to MSP's actions are integrated into the organizational security infrastructure. So kind of playing off the previous, the previous one, really. Right. Now, if these are the bigger ones where the SIMs are collecting stuff, 
In a big organization, that's one whole discussion. Right. But (laughs) what I just went through, there's a certain amount in the smaller business where you just have to have a certain level of trust. And then you're going to give me a regular report that shows me you are maintaining that commitment that you've done. Somehow we agree on that. Yeah. I I mean, I think at the, at the very least MSP should be able to say, here's, here's all the, the logs or activity of our remote access at the very least. All those Mm -hmm. should spit that out. Here's, here's when we logged into your systems, what time, what system, how long, all this kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. of course, those should match. Hopefully they're, they're matching tickets that were put in and all that kind of stuff. Even though you may not get that Mm -hmm. cross referenced information, still what you're kind of looking for is, you know, did, was there some kind of login after normal business hours that maybe shouldn't be happening or on weekends Mm -hmm. or something. Now, some MSPs have staff after hours and they do maintenance work after hours. Completely fine. But all you got to do is just say, hey, what is this 10 o'clock login at night? What's that all about? And if they got an answer for you, then great. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't require constant concern all the time at a level that you can't afford. Right. You know, we're getting there where we can afford more of that kind of monitoring, but we still have to count on, at least in the smaller businesses, you're still able to have that ability to connect direct with another small business. Yep. So that's what we're looking for. All right, where do we go next? So uh, the other one is regularly review MSP accounts and privileges in IAM systems and investigate unusual and unexpected changes. So we touched on this a bit, but... This is definitely one I think can be challenging for some MSPs that they are often so focused on protecting their clients that they are not looking at their own stuff. So mm. how yeah. how do you, how does your own accounts look and your own privileges make sure that nothing's going on in your own environment? Because remember, we're talking about the MSP risks here, not what's happening in the client environments right. specifically. So how am I looking at my own things and whether or not things are happening that shouldn't be happening. And am I mitigating those things? So investigate those types of things, certainly any unexpected changes. If you've got a SIM, like if you're an MSP and you got a SIM within your environment as much as possible, or you've got notifications set up, if something changes, notify me, or if some kind of login happens, notify me. The, the challenge is always the notification burnout. You know, you get so many <laughs> notifications all the time, but, but at the same time, you, you just have, you have to look at every one of them because I, I get it that 999 of them are, is trash, maybe 9,999 is trash, but one of them is going to be something you should pay attention to. And if that gets through, click. if that gets through you're you could be in trouble. So as, as I heard somebody say one time, the good guys, us, has to, we have to be right 100% of the time. The mm-hmm. bad guys only have to be right once. So yeah. it's just, unfortunately, it's part of what you have to deal with. The good thing is there's tons and tons more AI tools nowadays where you can feed this in, information in and just say, hey, does anything look crazy on all these notifications I'm getting? Yeah. So, I mean, there's ways to get there and, you know, where this would be onerous even five years ago, mm-hmm. we've got, we, you know, we have the technology now, we have the capability now, and we need to do better at it. We can build them better yeah. and stronger yeah. and faster. <laughs> <laughs> we can rebuild. Some, uh, I've noticed that some notifications are now prioritizing. So it's like, here's a priority one notification, two or three, based on, you know, the level of severity of what it might be. So at least it does give you the ability to say, okay, all priority one stuff, I'll look at it, you know, later on when I get a chance, anything that's a priority three, um, depending on how they, you know, how they uh, rule those. But, Don't worry. Yeah. yeah but uh, if it's priority three, then yeah, it's set off all the bells and whistles and alarms and everything else because it, it's a, a bigger, bigger deal to look at. So that's happening now. So that's a good thing. Well, and there's ways for you to build those into your own tools and your own workflow 
if you will, mm -hmm. within the MSP is you know your tools and you know what the tools are telling you. And you've gone and implemented tools that, you know, won't just allow them. And I know other MSPs have talked about this, the importance of not being able to have that admin access mm -hmm. um, all the time. But it, anytime somebody has to log in with admin access, you should have that logged somewhere as to why that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. We've got, and, and this is, I don't know how new to the industry it is, but we have a vendor that has an access tool that gives us the ability to basically create admin accounts on the fly. So mm -hmm. when we need it and it's been approved through the proper software channels, it creates a temporary admin account. And then once we log out, the admin account gets wiped. So it's, you know, admin on the fly, I call it. <laughs> Just in yeah. time admin service or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but I mean, I love yeah. it. I'm glad that I'm glad that this is now a thing that's out there. And I think that that's something that MSPs need to really consider rolling out in their environment. And, and yeah, it's an additional cost, but. Well, and it's an additional thing to log because if something's happening and it wipes that out, you know, I need to log what that admin was doing and know about it in case that gets breached, mm -hmm. you know? So, but it's just like anything else. You've got risk management there. Right. So I would love to, you tell me, this is the tool you're using. Okay. What are you doing to make sure you're securing that tool mm -hmm. and monitoring it for being breached? I want to know. Yep. So great. You, you going to show me that then. I just want to know how you're going to mitigate the risk that that brings to the table. And and I think that's the piece on the backside. We're doing all these things to mitigate your risk, mm -hmm. but we need to mitigate our own, right. our own, our, our own risks. <laughs> yes, I agree. So the, the next one here, well, just in case we didn't say it, the first one, the, the previous one is audit MSP actions via log analysis and prioritize procedures for alerting on and investigating unusual activity. I think we didn't say that before, but it's basically, it's starting to hit on the same thing. I'm seeing a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> like we're, we're fitting to change though. We're fitting to change. <laughs> but the, the theme so far is basically, you know, trust, but verify, trust, but verify, trust, but verify, you know, yeah. and, and find every way you can possibly uh, find to look at activity that's going on uh, that the MSP is supposedly doing uh, and also within their own environment to make sure those mm -hmm. things are, are legit. So the next but one. Now we pivot. Okay, now <laughs> we're pivoting. So uh, consider the need for MSP services if an incident occurs and choose service levels that provide the necessary level of support. Hmm. Hmm. So this is, this is a, a really... I know it's one of those where I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but if you sell three different levels of support mm -hmm. and you have multiple clients in dealing with, let's say you have a regional ISP outage, you have you know, something along those lines, you have some sort of regional incident. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I'll pay for it. I'll get a lower level that doesn't include help for an incident. Mm -hmm. And I'll pay for the incident with my insurance. That's kind of an approach some people take. But if I have a regional issue and I got people that have paid for me to be there for them, they're going to go to the front of the line. Is that a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. That's the way it should be. You know, they're, they're paying for that level of service. So if you're, if you're somebody who's like, oh, I'm good, I'll just call you when I need you. Not, not going to be in a monthly contract. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I when I talk to my clients that want to be in monthly contracts, I'm like, I have no problem with you being in a monthly contract. However, let's understand what the expectations are. Because when mm -hmm. it comes down to you and the other guy who's in a five-year contract and they're paying this all this additional stuff, uh, you're not going to get that level of service. So if you're okay with that, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not going to be... Drop everything priority. Right. Now, unless it's built into the agreement in order to trigger drop everything, then you're willing to pay basically catch up mm -hmm. of all. You know, I know IBM used to do a thing like that where 
with the the mid range systems that I worked on is like if you didn't maintain support, they'd be like fine, you know. But if you want us to now suddenly help you, then you're going to have to go back on support and pay for all the support. You'll pay a portion of all the support you didn't pay for yeah. in order to have the privilege of getting back on support where we can help you. Mm-hmm. And that, that gets complicated and people are like, what do you mean? You didn't pay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now you're going to get all the value of that. So <laughs> and I, I don't know that they still do that, but you're put into that position and people need to understand you know, it, it's some of those crazy stories that you see about, you know, where people think, well, I should get to go to the front of the line because. Yeah. Fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah. Or, or I love the ones that's like, um, okay, well, what does it cost to be in a thing, a contract? I'll go ahead and pay for that today. I'm like, no, yeah. you, you should have already been in a contract. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if I have X number of people under contract, then that allows me to have the resources available <laughs> for those people. That's right. You know, it's kind of like the ones who, you know, it's kind of that whole big question of your taxes pay for your police and your first responders and all of those things for a reason mm-hmm. so that they're there. You don't just pay for them when you need them. Yeah. <laughs> you pay for them to be trained and resourced to be there when you do need them. And that's essentially, you're that first responder line in many of those cases. So when yeah. you're building out these contracts, you need to think, if something goes wrong, you know, are you going to be able to be there for me on, you know, I, 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 I think I've talked about it before. One of the reasons I got out of the whole MSP world is somebody couldn't do a payroll one time they didn't want, they were break fixed. They didn't want to pay me to be around, but suddenly they can't get payroll done and it's Thursday night and payroll's due Friday morning. And my whole team is out doing something. You know, everybody's got, everybody's busy. You know, we have no obligation to you whatsoever and had an absolute fit blowing up phones yelling and screaming, (laughs) you've got to help me. This payroll has to get done. No, no, I don't. (laughs) No. I say that at some point there is an amount of money that would get me out of bed to help you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this person, they they wanted to pay their regular bill. Oh, yeah, no, no. no. For after hours. (laughs) And even then, you know, I mean, we were all out like, at events, doing things, family things. Everybody was doing, like, living life. Yeah. And I, how and dare gonna, you? How dare you? <laughs> I, I, how dare you not drop everything because I have a problem because payroll's tomorrow and I'm going to look bad. Well, still not my problem. And got nuts enough to have their attorney call me to the next morning about not providing service. And I said, they have no service contract. And the attorney's like, sorry to bother you. Got to go. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, you're you're right. And my answer was, it is not my problem. You didn't plan ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't plan ahead. So on this, on this line here, though, one thing that I would say to people is when your MSP says you're in an all you can eat plan, which yeah. is often the terminology used. You need to mm-hmm. ask specifically, what does that cover? Because all you can eat might be all you can eat support, not all you right. can eat instant response, <laughs> which yeah. is like for us, that's what, kind of what we do. You have, we have unlimited remote support. We have unlimited on-site support if you so choose. But if you have project work, that's not included. If you have an incident response, this above and beyond, there's a detailed explanation for it. But if we have to do anything above what we call level one response, that's not included. You're going to get billed for that because I don't know how long, I don't know how long an incident is going to last. We can do an initial level one investigation to figure out what it is and the mitigation steps that are needed. But if it's going to take usually more than two hours, it goes into a level two status. You're getting billed for that. Mm Mm-hmm. And that, that's why you want to specifically ask when they're telling you all this day-to-day stuff, 
we're going to handle people that need their password reset. We're going to handle printers. We're going to keep everything up and running. What if something goes wrong? Mm-hmm. That's where I want to know. Yep. And know that going in, and that's exactly what they're saying here. Well, which then takes us to the last piece, which is kind of flowing, as you mentioned, off of the previous ones. But this one goes right along with it. So Yeah. So perform and, tabletop exercises around instant response or system failures related to the MSP and incorporate the findings into an instant response and system recovery plan. So mm-hmm. you know what happens? So you kind of have to have the MSP involved in that, wouldn't you? You would think. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So what what if um what if my MSP business has some type of system failure or we're responding to something? How does that affect you as my client? Uh here's a good example. We several weeks ago I mentioned that we used the software Screen Connect and there was a vulnerability that came out that was announced on Screen Connect software and lots of MSPs were affected. I didn't know if we were affected or not when it first was announced. So I went ahead and shut down the Screen Connect software. Now, long story short, we were not affected because we had the cloud version, not the on-prem version, all this other stuff. And we had multiple layers of security. So we, we, weren't, we were never affected by it, but I didn't know that initially. So I shut mm-hmm. everything down. Well, some of our clients use Screen Connect through our services in order for them to work from home. So there you go. Mm -hmm. There's your tabletop exercise. If my services are disrupted and you can't work from home because of that, then then what are you going to do? Yeah. And that's exactly what you're supposed to do in these tabletop exercises. Yeah. (laughs) And your answer can't be, I'm going to call David. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because you're already talking to David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we we already had kind of some secondary things we were going to roll out to kind of mitigate it because it's not every client. So it's not like we had to come up with hundreds of different ways for people to log in. Uh, uh-huh. But but we had a we had another action plan that we were ready to put in place if we had to. You know, fortunately, we didn't have to. <laughs> yeah, but you had a plan. Yeah. See, I, I want to know that you have that plan. And if you're not asking your MSP these questions, like, it, and go beyond just them, what if one of their vendors has an incident? What are you going to do to help me? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and at some point, you know, the change healthcare thing is teaching everybody yeah. that it's so deep down in the supply chain and it's having such a major impact. You know, I saw a headline where, Physicians practice, small practice, had no money (laughs) and they were, they couldn't pay their bills, but they were still seeing patients. Yeah. You know, we talk sometimes about the, you know, regional issue, like if there's a regional disaster or a regional outage, how that pulls all the MSP resources. But the other thing to consider too, is a lot of MSPs have that one client that's like a massive amount of their revenue. If that one client has an issue, they, that one client could suck all the resources of the MSP because the MSP knows it's going to go out of business <laughs> if yeah. it's not, cause it's, you know, that client is 40%, 50%, whatever of their revenue. And so, mm-hmm. you know, now they get white glove treatment. Well, yeah. And you want to know where you stand in the pecking order. Yeah. You know, what, are, <clears> and, <throat> and it's not that there's a, you know, a, a way to, solve every single problem. It's just, you kind of want to know if this happens, what, what are my expectations? What, you know, what, what am I going to do? A lot of MSPs, and I wish more MSPs would do this, but a lot of MSPs will, will try to find other local MSPs that aren't douchebags to partner with, to say, look, if we ever need your help, can we call you and count on you to help without stealing our customers? It's something that we're seeing more and more. MSP nine one one. Yep. Uh, yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, it is something I wish more people would, would do. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people in our industry though that um, was, I saw a thing the other day. It was a cartoon, and somebody was like, uh, you know, yeah, I called support, and so I could be criticized and put down and acted like I'm ignorant and all that before I could get help or something like that. It was some cartoon. Uh. And basically, you know, it was kind of funny, but not because that's how people in general, I sent it to my staff and I was like, 
The sad thing about this funny cartoon is that that's what really happens. This is how the public really yeah. sees IT support that, you know, you're going to be talked down to and act like you're an idiot and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So you just need. And that's one of the reasons we do a whole session on that at the boot camp mm -hmm. is in order for it to be a, you know, we're bringing it all back around, but you know, in order for it to be a shared responsibility, it has to be a shared responsibility. Right. You have some responsibility to participate mm -hmm. as well in communication and working with people instead of at them. Yep. It goes both ways. And uh, there, that, that's a big reason that we go through that exercise and we do it with humor and you should send me that cartoon. We'll use it in that session <laughs> next week. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> but a lot of this, to me, when I first read this, a lot of this reminded me of a saying somebody said to me one time, which is, don't buy a used car from a mechanic. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and so I immediately thought about this because, you know, the mechanic's the one that keeps everybody else's cars running great, but they don't have time to work on their own. <laughs> yeah. You know, what is it? The cobbler's children have no shoes exactly. or yeah. going back that way. Exactly. It's the yeah. same thing. Like you're paying for an MSP to provide all of these services to support you and protect you and everything else. But how are they doing with their own service and support internally? It, it, yep. So not, not a problem that is specific to MSPs as we just <laughs> pointed out. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> all right ah, well, well it's a good one yeah that's our show for today folks thanks for listening be sure to share this out and go leave us a like and a smash and a big old thumbs up we appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> for donna and myself remember hip is not about compliance it's about patient care help me with hip hop let's get it right protect your patients been listening to the help me with hipaa podcast hosted by donna grendel and david sims the show created to help you with hipaa for more information or to ask us a question visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com neither donna grendel or david sims are attorneys and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance the information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.